Um, can I just say a word? Of course you can. Um, one of the what things is, that... Uh, well, pass the microphone. Yeah. 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 Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that uh, is maybe worth mentioning that I've noticed through the years, probably less so with you guys who are you know, information freaks. I mean, you, you know probably more about Star Wars than I do. But um, the Americans, it was almost policy to play down the fact that these films were made in Britain. They, it, they didn't really, I mean, they, they, I won't say that they actively lied about it, but they certainly didn't publicize the fact that the main unit shoots were done in London. Mm. And while I was working on Empire at Elstree, a friend of mine went to the States and she said that she, you know, through her trip, she had told people, ah, oh, a friend of mine is working on Star Wars 2 in England. And people were saying, no, 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 no Star Wars 1, no, that was, that's a Hollywood film. Mm. So, you know. That's a good point, though, yeah. because, as you say, the truth is... Uh, yeah, don't don't let the truth get in the way of a good lie. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We had a nice opening shot there, a Hoth coming in the background. A cameo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the Q and A earlier, as you say, Brian did a lot of research from the Lucasfilm point of view, and we don't have to do it in any particular order. Whatever comes to mind first. But have, apart from the faux pas about Pirewood and Elstree, the anything that leaps to mind that you would see and say in there that you thought, well, that's not quite. How it shook down. Anything, whichever one of you guys wants to speak first. Whichever well, one. Uh, Christian uh, mentioned something while we were out doing the walk around the hotel, as we started outside. The fact that it said that at, at both Kurt's base and Sharman base, yeah. there were four huts. There weren't. No, there weren't. Okay. One. 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 One hut. Yeah. One. Okay. One hut. Yeah. I don't know where they got that from. Right. Um, right. And everything was operated from those single huts. Yeah. Everything was done well, from those. Actually, huts. No, I mean, I don't, I don't think they were ever used. I, I think was never they, into them. I was never into them. I think that, I mean, there's that one photograph that you showed earlier yes. yeah. of the construction <coughs> crew hiding from the weather eating porridge. Yes. Where was that taken? That was on the top, I think. That on was the on the top. top. I yeah. think it was on the, on the very top, yes. Yeah, I think, I think so, so that was one of them. One of them, yes. But that's the only picture I've ever seen of any of them being used. Yeah. In fact, what I remember from, was it, what was the top one? Was that Kurtz or Kurtz? Kurtz. 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 Was that when we came here, when we eventually got up to the top, they couldn't find it. Okay. There, there were, you know, all of these two and a half meter high sticks that were showing the route. There was like that much of them, that, wow. so much snow had come yeah. that that hut disappeared. So th instead of really being functional bases, there were more marker points. They really were marker good. points, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think they had any practical use for us, oh, for okay. the crew. But then, as you pointed out earlier, what was planned was very different from what was achieved yeah. because yeah. the weather was so so appalling. So from a, this isn't to make any apologies for Lucas one, but from a Lucas one point of view, they may have had a breakdown of what they were expecting to build at those two camps, which might have said four huts. Yeah. But in reality, yeah, 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 yeah. there was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other things mm -hmm. leap out? Because because we're quite we're quite into dissecting these things because we know you guys were all there. And you've got recollection yeah. from, from dis discussing these things. Again, Christian and I were talking about outside the hotel that uh, our friend there asked me yesterday about you know, where was the trench shot? Where was, where was that? And uh, Christian and I were, were exchanging notes. And, you know, in the, in the chaos of filming, you, we all had our focus on our particular jobs. And it was just, okay, get into the, the snow track and follow the convoy. Mm. And the weather was blowing <laughs> like crazy. You didn't know where you were. No. Could have been well, no, it could have been anywhere. Yeah. You had this little <laughs> little windscreen wiper yeah. window through the front. Yeah. That, and it was just white out there. Yeah. I mean, I've got no idea where we went up there. No idea at all. No. I've got one, again, I was, we were exchanging notes earlier. There was one of the vehicles that had very wide tracks. Mm. I, don't, I don't know what it was called. Uh, yeah. it was a rat, rat, rat track, track, was it? Was it a rat track? Yeah, I think yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. 
but had an enormously powerful engine. It was, I think it was a, a straight eight cylinder, I mean, a, a big yeah. motor. Yeah, yeah. And that thing could go up 45 degrees, you know, with these incredibly wide tracks. And that had to tow all of our snowcats up individually, up wow. one steep path, yeah, yeah. to get to the top where we filmed. Yeah. And what part, what we filmed up there, I can't remember. No. <laughs> in terms of locations, then, is that, I mean, for you guys, in a practical sense, when you're working on it, is it, is it an advantage that a lot of it kind of looked the same? And is it an advantage that one day you can film down there, it looks one way because the snow's blowing that way, and the next day it's blowing a different direction? Is that an advantage or a disadvantage? Well, as far as we're concerned, you know, at our level, it makes no difference at all because we're just doing what we're told. Sure. We are not the decision makers. We weren't yeah. the decision makers. We just go, we went where we were pointed. Yeah. And did our little bit of the, of the overall picture. Yeah. Now, they chose a, a position for the probe robot. That was something that the effects department had a lot to do with. You know, we, we were heavily involved in the building of it and, and the tracks and the motors. And, and uh, I had to go up there and help get it all working and then pack it up in black plastic bags to, to, uh, to protect it from snow overnight and then go back for the shoot. But where it was, you know, I... <laughs> Couldn't tell you. No, because no, putting a marker down wouldn't work, would it? No, yeah. no, 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 no. But you know, it was somebody else's, uh, somebody else's job to get me up there. Sure. So you know, I mean, it is. It's a film work. It's very compartmentalised. Yeah. You do the bit that you're told to do, and that's you know, there's, you have a Phil Calder, the location, uh, the location manager. He's it was his responsibility to go together with the transport people to get us where we had to go. Mm. Wasn't necessary necessary for us to know where that was. No, <coughs> just to get there. Just to get there. You yeah. never looked yeah. at the map. I never looked at the map. No, 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 no. I mean, no, no. in the presentation earlier, Brian put up the the map with the different bases and different areas that, and yeah. the original map. I mean, I'm assuming that would have been the map you guys roughly worked from. Or something of its type. Again, I, it was of no, it was of no purpose to me. <coughs> you yeah. know, we were told, okay, tomorrow we've got to prepare the tr the, the battle site. So we had our our, our snow track and the, and the uh, the trailer behind it. So we filled the trailer up with the metal boxes that the explosives went into. It, every individual explosion had a, a metal box, like a a, a, a square sided. Um, steel welded from steel plates. It's just so that you don't blow stones up in the air. Right. Mm. You have this metal container that the explosives go into, and then cement or peat or cork or safe things to throw up into the air. So we, you know, you load all the stuff you need and the cables and the batteries and yeah. and get in the thing, and then you're driven. You know, I yeah. didn't need a map because I didn't have to get... No. I, it wasn't my responsibility to get me to the right place. Gotcha, gotcha. You didn't drive either. I didn't drive either, no. 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 Um, Harold, um, was one of the things that really fascinated me was how open uh, Lucasfilm were with what was happening in Norway um, in terms of they announced that they had the poster um, that everyone got in their gift packs um, of R2 on the skis, the yeah. press conference and even releasing an image from the shoot mm -hmm. whilst it was going on. Was that very much conscious decision-making to be very open because the publicity around Star Wars at that time must have been an immense amount of pressure? Well, in, in, in the weeks before uh, shooting, uh, we didn't get many instructions from, from Lucasfilm. So it was the local uh, 20th Century Fox office that uh, arranged uh, the press conference, uh, it was a friend of mine making this uh, R2D2 on skis. That was my idea. Yeah. We have to have a, a local uh, thing to to, yeah. to show and to use in the papers. And and uh, so so we, we were very free to do whatever we uh, could. And yeah. and uh, Lucasfilm did not uh, interfere with anything in the, uh, in, in, the, in the beginning, really. Yeah. So it, we we had a great time. Yeah. But it would be interesting to find out whether any of that information that Harold arranged for the Norwegian press reached America, mm. whether Lucasfilm decided to use that to publicize it in America, because yeah. as I say, I don't think they were very keen on... No, but the interesting thing, I hadn't seen that poster before 
of R2 before I started doing research for coming here. Oh, there you are. So uh, that maybe partly answers it. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a friend of mine making that uh, that uh, drawing. Yeah. And uh, he, he also, uh, we used him a lot to, to make uh, fronts on cinemas when we had openings. And uh, he's a very good artist, really. So. Yeah. I just think it's interesting that in, you mentioned obviously the UK doesn't didn't does now but didn't get the the recognition that it should have got for the films being made there and now here you are Empire this is the external location for the films being made Norwegian Star Wars fans obviously are proud of it but Norway Fox Norway as was of course must have had a, an immense sense of ownership for that big production coming here yeah. mm. and, and Gary Kurtz gave us a very uh, we, we, we could do, do the, most of it locally. Yeah. He was very open and we always informed him. And he said, he said yes to everything we suggested. So it, it was easy to, to cooperate with, with uh, Gary Kurtz the year before uh, and, and during the, 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 um, the shooting. So we invited the press from uh, the international press here and we did all that because he said, okay, that's, that's your business. So uh, he was very, very open. Maybe he was a little too open <laughs> for George Lucas. We don't know, but we know the history. So it could be uh, something there. But uh, he was very easy to, uh, to, to work with. And I'm very happy that, that uh, today I'm uh, living in Gary Kurt's room. Yeah. That was so good. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Martin, you're going to say something? No, you, you, just, to, uh, just to pick up what you said, that... Uh, that England should have got recognition. I'm not sure. You know, of course, all the English people working on the crew, you you want your your contribution acknowledged. But in terms of marketing the film, what perhaps benefits? I, perhaps Lucasfilm were correct in thinking to paint it as an entirely American film would be a better marketing strategy. Yeah, could well be. That to, from their point of view, sure, play down the English stuff, and you know, so that it's more thoroughly a hundred percent Hollywood film. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good point because the UK had that great reputation from the uh, ta tax breaks and various things, but great crews. So a lot of American productions, Superman came here, and all the you know, Lucas and Spielberg stuff came here. So obviously, the UK had a great rep to, to a point when the, the economic situa situation changed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you, that's probably quite a good point that uh, American. All of the Raiders films, for yeah. example. You know, they were all made at Elstree, but uh, you don't hear an awful lot about that. Like maybe more nowadays because there are yeah. more people like you. There are more people that are interested in the back, the making of, and uh, you know, the details. Yeah. But the general cinema going public, they're not interested. You know, they. They, you know, they just want the end the product. Yeah. That they're mm. interested in, not yeah. the background stuff. Good point. Good point. Christian, yeah. working on the film, when you first came across the project, being aware of what you were going to do, first things first, I mean, to us, Martin makes a great point that Star Wars is you know, it's a big deal and fans are into it and we dig into the history of it now, like archaeology almost. How aware were you of Star Wars at all when you first came across it? I was asked by um, um, Svein, Svein Johansen, who's a Norwegian production manager. I worked with him a lot. Uh, fantastic guy, fant best first assistant director in my life. <clears throat> and he asked me if I wanted to join him on this production. And I said, what's that, Star Wars? And I, yeah, I've seen something about it in newspapers. And this was probably late, uh, late 70s, no, it must have been, yeah, late 78. And uh, I think it was you, Arnold, who rented Colosseum and showed us. Yeah. Number one for us. For Elin, Hilde, Svein, yeah. and me. So and I was deeply asleep when it finished. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Christian, is oh, one God, of, so Christian is one of the few persons I know that have been working on, on The Empire Strikes Back for uh, three, four, five months. And he said, and I didn't like the film. No. I slept. So. Uh, but we rented, we rented uh, I, I told some people here the other day that uh, probably the, the nicest cinema in Europe, Colosseum Cinema in Oslo, and uh, the group of us, we, we five of us, six of us, yeah. five, six of us, we saw the, 
uh, first Star Wars to inform what, what, what is this but about? But neither of us had seen the first one. Hmm? Neither of us had seen the first no, one. Neither of us had seen it. So, so we were trying to have some idea of what we were yeah. going to do. Um, there's always a, an interesting quote that um, I always recall back to that George Lucas made about he was more worried than about the concept and how they would achieve the concept that that would you know solving the problem would come later um, so for each of you in your different roles I just wondered was there a particular problem that you faced and uh, maybe how you over overcame that no I think uh, coming into this product uh, it was uh, to me it was quite new because I haven't hadn't been into any production before because I was a, a distribution okay. guy. 20th Century Fox of Norway. We had we imported and, and distributed pictures to the Norwegian cinemas. So uh, when we got the chance to do this, we found it uh, very very interesting. Yeah. It was a great job. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, it's strange, you know, it seems really strange to say it now, but uh, probably the thing I had to overcome was, was lack of enthusiasm. And it sounds really strange, but as Christian was saying, you know, the first, the first film had been released, and it was a huge hit. I'd gone to see it, and I wasn't impressed. You know, it, it was too bright, too goody baddy, too simplistic for me. And I just came off Alien when I was about to start this one. And Alien for me was something you know, really special because the, the look of it was amazing. It was dark, it was spooky, and you had Giga's weird monster and fantastic interiors of the spaceships. Everything was... Yeah, I mean, that was a film that I, I was really enthusiastic about. So when Brian Johnson said, hey, look, we, you know, I've, we've, got, we've got a follow-up, we've got a, a film to go straight on to, and pulled me off, pulled me out of the workshops where, we were, where we'd made all the, the Nostromo models and the, all, all the models for, for, for the model shoot for, um, for Alien, and Ridley Scott, was, had, they were just finishing the main unit shoot and were about to start shooting the models over at Bray Studios. And, and Brian pulled me out and said, well, I want, you know, we, I've got Star Wars at Star Wars 2. I want you to go over to Elstree and start setting the, setting the workshops up. And I was, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I want to be in Bray and, you know, the Ridley Scott and filming that. But of course, you know, yeah. I've got a year's work ahead of me. So it's like, ah, I've got a job, great. So do what the boss says. But I wasn't kind of blown away at the thought of working on Star Wars. But you also have to remember that in, in the 70s, there was no guarantee that Empire Strikes Back was going to be a hit. Absolutely, well, yeah. It could have flopped, you know, it could have been, yeah, because they didn't do sequels in those days. No. Sequels were almost unheard of. You sometimes had, like, Hammer House of Horror. Yeah. They would make several vampire films or Frankenstein. Well, you know, there yeah. was that kind of general, there was the Carry On series. You remember that? Yeah, of course. So sequels were a kind of, well, it's a bit of a no-no. Mm -hmm. So when they said, yeah, there's a sequel coming out, there was no guarantee it was going to make any money. And Star Wars as a phenomenon, Star Wars as a kind of, iconographic part of film his history it, that wasn't in the 70s no that has grown and grown and grown and grown and grown through the subsequent decades it wasn't in place then so you know, you know it's an empire but i mean of course through the course of it it was it was a fantastic thing to work on and and really interesting and you know the, i mean yeah there were a thousand and one details i could talk about sure. but that was the first kind of to answer your question, it was about enthusiasm mm. from Star Wars. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> There's maybe an element of that as a positive thing if you're going into a project and you're not caught up in the drama and the hysteria and the media about the project that you're well, able just to focus on your job. Well, the first one, I, I recently um, listened to a podcast. What are they called? Um, Film entries or oh, Jamie Benning, yeah, Jamie Benning, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was the one with Madeline Most, yes, who yeah. was the camera assistant, and um, 
she talked to, she talked a lot about that about filming the first one when they filmed Star Wars one. The, the, the English crew at Elstree, they were really dismissive. This is some heap of shit. <laughs> I mean, really. You know, oh, I know, I know. The first assistant apparently was really rude to George Lucas. They were, you know, they were they were not helpful. No. The, the the director of photography was very unhelpful. Gil Taylor. Gil, Gil Taylor. I mean, he Gil Taylor was a you know a big figure. Yeah. You know, he was a very famous photographer. Stop. What's this rubbish? So he was very patronising towards Lucas. Yeah. Nobody knew that Lucas was this boy genius. Mm. This, so is, this is an answer by else he doesn't get much of the credit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No big thanks from Lucas. No. Yeah. And Johnny Steers, who did the effects on the first film, he uh, went to court with, with Lucasfilm because he felt that he had been a big part of designing R2-D2 mm. and got rapidly bounced out of any idea of royalties on that <laughs> yeah. score. Yeah. So he didn't, get, he didn't get number two because he'd upset Lucas. Yeah. So that's how Brian Johnson was that. Because mm. Brian Johnson had done uh, a TV series called Space 1999. Yeah. That was, that was the, you know, how he got chosen. But no, nobody knew it was going to be, a, you know, that we would 45 years later be sitting here oh, talking about oh, absolutely. it. Yeah, this, that was not thinkable at no. that time. We do a lot of interviews with different actors and crew folks, and, and a lot of them, because you're working, you meant, we were outside talking in the snow, and you were saying, you know, it was the 70s, we were working men, we were moving from job to job. Yeah. And a lot of the actors say, eh, it's a week. I got paid 200 quid. It was a job, you know. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. So it, it, it's yeah. kind of of that. No, I'm sure. I'm sure all of the uh, all of like like the, um, the guy playing Chewbacca and Tony Proud, the guy playing C3. I mean, the, the fact that that years and years later they could go to conventions all over the states and sign autographs and get you know that would have been a major surprise. Absolutely. That was that was like uh, where did this come from? Yeah. You know? Christmas but then I in. was asking. I was sitting at lunchtime today, asking some of the some of the guests here, "What is it? You know, what is it about about the Star Wars franchise? What is it about those first three films that has made this possible? What is it about?" And I and I was just talk, thinking out loud and saying, "Is it the fact that it's such a kind of You've got the good guys and the bad guys, and the good guys win. And yeah, well, it's not just that because Robin Hood is that too. Mm. So, what is the charm? What is it that has made Star Wars so fantastically successful and so interesting to you guys? What is it? I, I, I think there's a dozen different reasons. Yeah. And I think most people would agree that it's Tell a mixture me. of when it, when it came out, the age we were when it came out, yeah. the, the merchandise that came along with it. Yeah. There was a special kind of magic about that film that, that hit kids when they were between eight and ten years old. Yeah. And just the fact that the sequels were so good. Yeah. And I always think it's, it's the McCartney thing when McCartney, he couldn't read music for years. And he said, if I knew how to write a Beatles song, I couldn't write a Beatles song. And Spielberg said the same. Mm. Yeah, if I knew how to do it, it would become formulaic and then people would figure me out. So mm. it's kind of better when it's that... That sort of quicksilver thing. So it's thing. just some magic. There. Just some magic. Yeah. yeah. Where uh, you know we were talking about Rebel Moon, new film that came out on Netflix last year that everyone said was going to be the mega big mega smash, and I haven't heard anybody talk about that film for about two months. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. and yet Star Wars. Here we are, forty-five years later, yeah. and here we are sitting in yeah. Norway yeah. talking about it. Yeah, so yeah. The, the 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 sci-fi film that came out a year or so ago that had a little kid that was a robot with like a hole in the ear. The creator. Yeah. What was it called? The creator. Creator. Now I remember seeing a trailer for that in the cinema, thinking, "My God, that looks amazing!" Ah, wow, look at that! And it disappeared. And I saw it on some one or other of the streaming channels, and it was a. Like, mm. So what makes that kind of? What is it that? grabs everybody's attention and I think I think so many other franchises and so many other filmmakers have been reaching for that for decades to try and get their own version of and yeah. a couple have come close yeah. you know yeah. but no one's ever quite quite got it no so, and I was talking to some of the some of the guests about my, my son is now working in London um, and he worked on Andor and uh, was down to work on one of the TV spin-offs and they pulled them back they, yeah. they delayed them all 
and the Marvel Universe have delayed their films, there's a big question mark about because they're not doing the business they thought they would do. I mean, what do you think about the TV spin-offs? Mix for me, where there's some of them fantastic. Oh. Um, Andor um, series I absolutely love. But a lot of people say it's not Star Wars because it's so radically different from the kind mm. of storylines we've seen before. Yeah. Mm. Then there's other elements of it where you feel it's a little bit flat and a little bit of a disappointment. Like there was a lot of excitement over the Obi-Wan Kenobi series and it just didn't have that spark that ignited my imagination. Mandalorian? And, what did you think of Mandalorian? Uh, first two series I really enjoyed. Last last series. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. But it's all subjective. It's, all, it's all very subjective, and I think sometimes, it sometimes it's all about the timing of when a project comes out as well, yeah. and that it just catches the mood of the public at the right point in time. Yeah. And yeah. You, I think you see that as well. How like Star Wars has never really caught on significantly in the Asian market, Is and it's right? just yeah, and it's right. just, and I think that's something that Disney's trying to correct, and you know the next TV series that come out. Um, the Acolyte has very much an Asian flavour to its style. So you think, you know, they're trying different things to capture that imagination of people. Yeah, yeah. So I think even, even the today... Lightsabers the, 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 Yeah, mm. it's, it's like, like you've all said, there's there's not a formula you can go back to. It's, you've got to find that little bit of magic somewhere. And and as you said, that sort of the, the zeitgeist, yeah. the, the the spark of the time. I mean, it? Star Wars is to me. Star Wars is <coughs> flared trousers, disco. <laughs> Star Wars and Greece and Saturday Night Fever are kind of all together. Yeah. It's 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 the most of its era of all the films. Yeah. You can you can pin Star Wars to a time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, coming out of that, you know, three day strikes at home, Watergate in the states. You know, it's that kind of era. So yeah. Star Wars is is kind of a the the you know the gift. That, that that era got, but and maybe a rem maybe a reminder of happier times. Yeah, yeah. because the the world is so threatening now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. It's yeah. a safe it's a safe place where a lot of people have travelled here. It's, it's something that we're passionate about. Yeah, you know, it's certainly. Yeah, yeah. And the uh, lady to. that I was sitting next to at lunch because I was asking the same question, and she said, "No, I, that's right. They're, they're, she's a teacher, and her husband works in casualty in a hospital." And I said, wow, you know, your two jobs are really important. My job? You know, I spent my life making stuff that's disappeared. You know, it all, all, everything I made ended up in a skip thrown away somewhere, and it exists on film, but does it? You know, you can't even get VHS copies <laughs> anymore. Nobody uses DVDs anymore. No. So, uh, but then she said, yeah, but people need escapism. So perhaps it does fulfill it. And I think you're right, it's like, I look at the Andor TV series, and it's probably as far away as Star Wars as you can get. It's not really about the war and the conflict. But if you're turning on the news at the moment, that's all there is, is yeah. war and conflict. Yeah. So maybe the fact that I enjoy that more is the fact it's something other than war and conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, must, I, I agree with you, I liked Andor best of all yeah. the... All the time. Because it seemed to me, yeah, not so derivative, not just yeah. milking the cow. It seemed to be scripts that actually took the universe further. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mandalorian I, I didn't like because I thought so much of the acting was so bad. Mm -hmm. But that's just, you know, as you said, yeah. subjective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they gave us baby Grogu. Have the two of you ever experienced uh, this interest for the production side of a movie like we can now see for, for The Empire Strikes Back? No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm a Star Trek fan as well, don't yeah. hit me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And, and there's definitely an interest there, but in that sort of fandom, I yeah. think the interest is as much in the performers and the actors. They, they very much blend with the characters, so that's kind of different. And there's an interest, but nothing like yeah. nothing like this. I can't. I don't know of any other franchise where you would travel to here or somewhere like here yeah. just to be here and feel the the flavour of it and speak to gentlemen like you and who are part of it. And yeah. you know, there's nothing else I can think. I don't know what you think, Brian. Yeah. I can't think of any. I can't think of anything either. It's yeah. if you're in a city, and you maybe can think of 
a location that was from a movie, you might go there and get your photo taken in front of it. Yeah. But I can't think of a scenario where you would get so many people, like the number of people in this room would go out their way to travel the distance that so many people have come halfway across the world and more to be together to celebrate something like this. Mind you, all the, I mean, most of the opinion polls that I've read specify Empire Strikes Back as the Star mm. Wars film. I mean, it comes yeah. number one yeah. of all the Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. And of the Empire Strikes Back, what is it that stands out? You know, it's, it's as Harold said, it's hot. Yeah. It's, that's the glamorous part of it. It's the, that's the sort of, wow. And it's also the interesting aspect that the start of the film yeah. um, with the big battle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the climax of the film. It's a very different structure to the film. Yeah. 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 And the Wampa and the Torn Torn. Yeah. You know, they, they got it right. Yeah. They, got the, they got the elements really right. Cool. And the common, as, as Harold said, when he went to Elstree and saw the, uh, the hangar the, uh, in the Star Wars stage built for that set, Millennium Falcon sitting in the middle of that sort of what should what looked like sort of laser cut ice. Mm. It was a brilliant set, of course, fantastic, fantastic set. So the interiors and the exteriors cut yeah. together worked so well. And how aware were you guys when you were working on it of what would be done at Elstree? I had no idea. You didn't know how it would intercut at all. I That's good care. though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> No, I didn't know very much of it. I mean, uh, I, I worked, I started, I worked September to September. And the preparation period, I saw them, obviously I was there in Elstree when they were building the Star Wars stage. Yeah. Because there wasn't a stage big enough for those two sets, the, the Bog Planet and, uh, and the, the, the hangar. Yeah. But I didn't know what they were going to look like. No context, there was no context no, for what you're looking no, at. No, yeah. not at all, not at all. I mean, what I remember mostly from that time is um, I was, and I was lying in bed last night, preparing myself for this, just trying to get the details right, and thinking, was I, was I invited to Finsa first, and then they fitted the torn, built the torn torn around me because I was going to Finsa. Or did I go to Finster because I was the smallest guy on the crew? And you know, I'm <laughs> no, not sure. Totally. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. that was part. That was you know, the, the preparation period. I was up in the makeup uh, department a lot, being fitted into that. We made the, the the effects department made the metal work for the you know for the the, the, the sort of seesaw yeah. thing that I sat in and that supported the body. But then all the movements for the head, that was Stuart Freeborn's department. And I had to go up and he was adjusting so that I could reach everything yeah. and rehearse with it. Yeah. So there was that. And then building the probe robot um, arms, because the probe robot had to go, bef you know, that had to be sent. We had, a, we had a date where it had to be packed in its box and sent away for Christian to unload at the other end. <laughs> yeah. But then what I mostly remember that period is is The Shining. Mm. Because The Shining was being filmed in Elstree. Every time The Shining finished with a set, Star Wars would move into it. Yeah. So when, when we were doing preparation at Elstree, uh, The Shining had most of the studio. So I saw, and my brother was working on that, right. so I got to get in and see Kubrick sets, wow. which were very special. Yeah. Can I ask you about the operating of the Tonton? Yeah. And w how difficult was it? Because it's part of my presentation. Well, it was mostly that, yeah. uncomfortable, you know, because I'm sitting on this. I had to. I had this uncomfortable seat and something to rest my feet on, and my arms were up here with a bunch of rugs. I couldn't see what I was doing. And if you remember the piece from the from the film this morning. Yeah, because because uh, it's in one the the making of book that um, I think it was Alan Tompkins off the top of my head who commented that it was incredibly difficult to work with. But I think we had a discussion on Friday and you thought he was maybe referencing the, the I think Wampa. He, I think he was talking about the Wampa. Yeah. Yeah, because he was talking about how heavy it was to carry on your shoulders. I didn't have, I didn't have any weight on that. Yeah. That was all on the frame. Whereas Des Webb, <laughs> you mm. know, the poor guy in that Wampa yeah. suit. I mean, he was, that was a struggle. Yeah, I think he talked about um, how painful it was and yeah. the, the whole yeah. Um, yeah. performance yeah. for him. Yeah. But, but looking, at that, we, we, I, I, looking at that film this morning, or those segments that you showed this morning, 
of me in the thing. And, and Irving Kirshner said, it's too jerky, it's too jerky. And of course, I, nobody had told me, I didn't get schooled in making slow no. and ponderous movements as a creature of that size. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I was just like, well, I'll pull this and I'll do that and see what they say. You know? <laughs> and what they said was, it's too jerky, it's too jerky. So I had to slow it down. But, I mean, really, I should have, I should have spent a number of hours with, with people feeding back. Yeah. You know, and I moved like, the, no, take that bit slower and move the eyes. No, that, that doesn't yeah. work. Nothing. No, nothing. straight in, straight deep in. end. Yeah. Deep end. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and Christian, and, and your role in the production, you were there from pre-production yeah, up from here. early January to yeah. uh, Easter. Yeah. And yeah. what aspect was the most challenging challenging for you? Was there, was there something that... Because I, I, I... The first most challenging was yeah. too many working hours. Yeah. I mean, I, was, I went up at 6. I was out there starting the week at uh, 7 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, cleaning of the snow. Sometimes there were blown the snow into them and packed the snow. And yeah. And tanking, filling the tanks, and uh, and get the people off, and driving some some of them as you know, coming back and coming back, I had to back uh, some of the trailers back into the tents, uh, tank filling the tanks again, and uh, it was midnight before I think. Yeah, because there was a, 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 a lot of people on the production talked about it was the camaraderie of the crew that got them through it. Because there, there were so many, it must have been demoralised in a sense. Like when you've worked so hard to create the trenches, and you go back the next day and they're completely filled in, and <laughs> it's just uh, and that kind of environment, it must have been I incredibly difficult. The trenches, you know? <laughs> but one thing is quite important about uh, why this. When I, I worked on it, it was not important for me the result. Is that when I worked on the Norwegian production? Where we were at that time in the 70s, we were a crew of 20 people, and it was uh, the DOP and me. I was a, used, to, used to work as a gaffer, so I worked closely with the DOP. And then you have an influence on the result of the film. Mm. Here, I was just a tiny little piece, nobody mm. cared. I, I didn't know what, I, didn't, I hadn't seen in the script, I had no idea. Yeah. We were just doing what we were told. But in, 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 the, in the films I were used to work on, I had an influence. Mm. And that's a big difference. Yeah. Then you get enthusiastic or you hate it. But I mean, here it was just another work. Yeah. And on a big just hard work. Yeah. Hard yeah. work. Because the, because the yeah the hours the temperatures the ba that battle sequence. Um, I, I mentioned these steel boxes. I mean, just just to just to maneuver those steel boxes into their positions. When you're knee deep in snow, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a major undertaking just to drag these things. Just walk for yourself. It's just to walk yeah. for yourself, and then having set the metal boxes into place, then you have to run out cables back to the firing position. Again, you saw you you saw the distances involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then having run out the cables, you have to fill them up after every shot with bags of cement or peat or cork or. You know, it's just exhausting. Yeah, and constantly cleaning up and making sure everything's exactly. back to... Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we mentioned this virgin snow. Yeah, thing. exactly. I was thinking of that, yeah. Go on. Yeah, uh, because you know what virgin snow means. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's no it's footprints. No footprints, no tracks, nothing. And, and you have to drive out all the supplies to where you made explosions like that. You couldn't drive anywhere. You had to be very, very specific on which tracks you could use, which tracks you could walk in. And I remember when we came up to the location with uh, with uh, all the equipment, we need to turn around, and we need, I mean, those vehicles needed like 200 meter diameter to turn around, big. And uh, it, it was so complicated if you want to overtake another one, because then you would drive into the virgin snow, you know. Yeah. And uh, that was uh, that was quite a hassle. That slowed us down in many ways, mm. and we got stuck, and we had to back up with the trailers, and uh, mm. without touching it, the snow outside the tracks. Yeah, and we the the, the rebel soldiers, when the eighty eighties came, we had to run yeah. in between all these explosives. Martin was just sitting there, fired them off, and we had to run and not to 
step on them. Yeah. It was quite quite uh, interesting. I can yeah. imagine. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, a lot of it is time consuming. I mean, obviously you've got a, a plan of what's going to be done, so you know what's going to be done. Mm. But from the way you all describe what you did, it's yeah. not oh, no, shoot, no, retake, go again. No, it's no, a no, lot no, of resetting. No, no, take two would take a long time to reset. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, of course, one of the major one of the major advantages of CGI. Yeah, is that when they put all the explosions in afterwards, they can just keep filming and keep mm. filming. So, I mean, CGI has it, it's it's it, you want you can't you can't over you can't underestimate just what a revolution CGI has been in the film business because it I mean Virgin Snow for example you yeah know, you can just paint it out yeah. Yeah. wires I worked on one film uh, a, a film called Brazil Terry Gilliam's Brazil where we had a, 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 a in his dreams the main character could fly. So there were an, an, a number of dream sequences of him with wings flying. So we made a one to eight scale mechanical model yeah. hanging from very thin piano wires. And we spent weeks filming that yeah. on a model stage with a painted background and, and uh, artificial clouds. And, and it would look great. We'd watch the rushes the next day and it would look great, great. And then suddenly you'd see a wire just glinting. It would just One of the wires would catch a light. Yeah. And so, oh, I would say probably ninety percent of what we filmed was thrown away because of you. Even though you paint, sprayed them all carefully blue, and you know, nowadays you just, you could use wires that were thick and and you leave them visible and they just take them away. But I think you've inadvertently hit on another reason why Star Wars is so loved because people who know how it was made know the effort and the time that you guys put in, ILM put in, and all the yeah. all the constituent parts. But y if you made Empire Strikes Back now, today, with, with all the technology we've got, to, you mentioned the creator, that's probably going to win the Oscar for visual effects, it's phenomenal. Yeah. But it wouldn't be the Empire Strikes Back. No. It just wouldn't. It would, it, there'd, there'd be too many tools in the toolbox, the temptation to do too much would be there. Which I think uh, the, was the, the trap that Lucas fell into with The Phantom Menace mm. 3. Those, you know, the prequels. I think he got he he had too big a paint box. Unlimited power. Yeah, mm. and I think it showed because it was like overkill for yeah. me at least. Sure. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Compared to the first three. Yeah, yeah. And for 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 I mean, Kirshner and the photographers to, to see what they have filmed, we had every night to to send uh, today's shooting with a night train either to Bergen or to Oslo, depending on. Uh, which way was open, yeah, and 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 uh, then over to London, develop and back again. It took us a couple of days before they could see what they filmed, and that uh, that was quite shooting in the dark almost, aren't yeah. you? Yeah, shooting in the dark, yeah. very much. Yeah. yeah, I worked on one film with Peter McDonald uh, later. Um, and and the, our practice uh, it was this, I was on second unit with Peter. Peter was directing second unit, and uh, we would at lunchtime go to the viewing theatre to watch the rushes of the stuff that shot the day before. Right. And one day we went uh, we went to the viewing theatre, and they started the roll, and it was all black. I mean, there was nothing there. And as we came out, I turned to Peter and said, "What what was that?" He said, "I fucked up." <laughs> uh, that simple. Yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say lens cap. No, 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 no. <laughs> just, you know, he got, he got the, uh, he put the wrong stop or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He yeah. fucked up. Well, Peter McDonald was so good at his job yeah. that he would survive that. Yeah. yeah. Because the other 99 days or whatever would be, you know, magnificent. Yeah. So the, so the, the office would not. <clears throat> Yeah, they'd allow yeah. him a fuck up, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, of course, because they, uh, as you say, you know, take two days to get the rushes back, yeah. and then maybe you've got to go and do a retake of stuff because it didn't work, or because there was a hair in the gate, or because yeah. you know, some <clears throat> stupid technical problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when you can see it immediately, you know, the CGI is, is uh, even though I hate it, it's uh, it's it's a revolution. Yeah. It's a useful tool in that respect, oh, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, I was talking with Christian, uh, because Christian has his own lighting firm, and we were talking about the fact that, CG, that um, digital cameras are so much more light sensitive. 
So you don't need the amount of lamps you used in the Yeah. Mm. I mean, how, um, Knut, Knut, Haraldson, Haraldson uh, was, I was talking to Knut about another gaffer, a Norwegian mm. gaffer, and he said, thank God for digital cameras, because as he's got now in his close to 60 or over 60, yeah, I it's all small lamps and lightweight cables. Yeah. And he said, thank God it's not the great, the great big lamps I started with. Yeah. So it's a you know a huge difference. You know, carrying your, carrying the, even only the stands for this big eighteen k lights, yeah, out yeah, in yeah, the yeah, snow yeah, in the winter yeah, and yeah, yeah. the heavy cables. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. killing me. Yeah, yeah. yeah I stopped yeah. doing that when I was fifty. Is there also a change in attitude in terms of George Lucas wanted a nice planet, even when everyone was telling him you can't do special effects on a white background, where the attitude today would probably be the complete opposite. They would start from what can we achieve rather than start from the point of this is what I creatively want to achieve. Yeah. 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 Is, is that a, I think that must be a big part of the change in, in I, I wonder I wonder how much having having a massive amount of choice mm -hmm. how, how much of that is a help or how much is of it is a hindrance. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it could be that the limitations that one has if you've got a whole bunch of limitations, then you can be really artistic within that frame. Totally. Yeah. It's the shark in Jaws. The less you see, the more alien. Yeah. The less yeah, you see yeah, the yeah, alien, yeah. the scarier it is. Isn't it? So if you could have had a CGI shark and they'd used it a lot, it maybe the film wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have know, been. half as good. No, it's the threat of it's not seeing it. It's what you yeah. don't see. Yeah. Maybe the same with Alien, with the first one, yeah. where Ridley Scott was very, very careful to never show full figure until the final bit where it was hanging from the escape pod. Yeah. The only time you ever saw the whole creature. The rest of the time it was just a tail, <coughs> a bit of head, uh, yeah. you know, uh, claws. Yeah, the, the, the tongue. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's what... The, the imagination. The imagination. The, yeah. It's the fear of the unknown. The fear of the unknown, yeah. This mm. sort of, mm. this threat. Yeah, what we don't see is, is worse than what we do see. Totally. Yeah. Has anyone out in the audience got any questions that would like to ask our guests? Please, please. Yep. Go for it, Andy. Um, I've seen some aerial photos. This is a, a, a very technical question about the building in Fincer. Aerial photographs showing some turrets, the, 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 the rebel gun turrets, set up just down by the tented village where you had the workshops and things. So there are two turrets stood, stood there. Just wondering whether you did any filming, whether it was second unit, whether it was explosions. No, no, they just were just they were just yeah, placed there, placed yeah, there yeah. before they were taken up onto the glacier. Definitely. Yeah. Nothing but nothing was done with them there. Because that those turrets we had the special effects department, we had an oxyacetylene <coughs> rig to make them fire. You know, so it was possible that we could make an explosion come out of them. And one of our guys, um, Philip Knowles, were, was in one of the rebel costumes because he had to duck inside it and turn the gas off between takes. So, but all those were done on the battle site. Thank you. There wasn't anything shot here. Yeah, you, you. yeah. Uh, one for Harold, really. Obviously, the success from Empire uh, did it put kind of twenty century. Norway on the map, and did, did that kind of open doors for other productions to come to Norway? Well, I, th I think it uh, probably did a couple of years later, but uh, because uh, at the time we had had not many international productions here, and, and um, nobody knew about this production before we started, before we had, uh, had the, the, the big press conference in Oslo. And then they started to get interested, and, and uh, I think it uh, put uh, Norway and, and also the 20th Century Fox on Norway on the map. Yeah. And, and for us locally in, in 20th Century Fox in Norway, it really put us on the ma map. So uh, we got a, a big star in the, in the 20th Century Fox organization. That was, uh, that was great mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. And also it was... Uh, uh, box office, I think the Empire Strikes Back uh, for us in Norway, as far as I remember, was uh, even bigger than uh, Star Wars. It was a big success. Yeah. Okay. 
I think one of the things that stops foreign films coming here is that it's a very expensive country. You know, they, like everything costs a lot of money. When people hear about the cost of food, the cost of restaurants, the cost of a beer, the cost of transport, it's like, whoa, whoa. It's, you know, they want to go and shoot in cheap places where they can get stuff for nothing. Tom, Tom Cruise is coming. He's well, he, yeah. he, he, like, he, like it <laughs> he likes it. He likes it. He likes it. I mean, the, there is spectacular yeah. nature. He's coming oh, yeah. for the. He he, he's coming for the, the nature. Yeah. 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 I mean, he did that motorcycle job. Yeah, that was it. Some friends of us uh, were, they were in in the Ondansnes that day, and they stopped all the traffic. And as far as I uh, heard from them, he had seven jumps mm -hmm. before they were satisfied. Seven motorcycles, everything. But they still have one in the Ondalsnes, and they're going to display it in the, in the, the square. <laughs> but shortly after the Empire, um, Superman 2 came out. Yeah. yeah. I was on that with Eden Eriksen. For, I think it was a year. What did they do? What did they, I worked on the, on the English end of that. What did they do here? I did. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, Alan Brando. No. No, he was in the first one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Christopher Reeve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was kind of coming out of the white. He went walking off into the Fortress of Solitude, did he? And yeah. came walking back. Yeah, and it was, a, was, a, was a big truck with oil pipes yeah. passing by. It was supposed to be shot in Alaska, but they did it in Norway because it was, it was cheaper. The diner, yeah. when he stops for the diner. Yeah. 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 It was only a couple of days. He was a yeah. nice guy, Christopher Reeve. He was a very nice very guy. Very nice guy. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned what a nice guy Mark Hamill was. I mean, we kind of know that, but you really, he really uh, endeared Mark himself Hamill, to the group. Mark Hamill was a lovely guy. He was really, really sweet. He was, he was unaffected. He, he didn't have any kind of stuck-up star stuff about mm. him. He was just a really nice feet on the ground guy. And he was really sweet. Really, just a pleasure to work with. Lovely guy. Very few of them are, are accessible like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that they're all horrible, but they're, you know, I think that when they're not performing, they probably get, the, this whole fan thing must be exhausting. Yeah. So they just kind of, you know, you don't, you, very few of them you get close to. I think, I think when they are climbing, trying to get famous, they are worse. When yeah. they are up there, yeah. Yeah. they are more relaxed. Yeah, maybe. maybe. I, worked in, I worked in Bergen with uh, Donald Sutherland. And he was fantastic, crazy guy, very nice, <laughs> very friendly. Robert De Niro invited me to a party in Buenos Aires. <laughs> come, Martin, come, now come and sit with me in my car. Yeah, all right, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't happen very often. Was that on no. the mission? <laughs> the mission, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 That was a tough thing to work on. That oh, was a great thing to work yeah. on. But it was hard, wasn't it? It was hard, yeah, yeah. but it was a wonder. I mean... Five months in South America? Thanks mm. very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? So yesterday we saw a bunch of pictures about the decision making of bringing uh, Empire Strikes Back here. And um, so there were a lot of figures on these pictures, but uh, I don't remember seeing George Lucas anywhere. So was, was he completely uninvolved with the. The whole project, or, or what's the story? I think he, yeah, yeah didn't hear it first. Yeah, he was asking if was, George Lucas was involved in the process of deciding to come involved here. involved in, uh, in, in the planning? In, did you ever see and, him? And select we, 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 we never, we, we never, never saw him. No, no, no it was, no, no, no. he just uh, was dealt here. with uh, yeah. Gary Kurtz. Yeah. And then George Lucas was never here, and, and uh, we never met him. So uh, Gary Kurtz, uh, I think. To, to us, he was he was the producer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. much. One hundred percent. So. Yeah, very much. And he was so. very nice guy to, to to work with. He was uh, Gary Kurtz was. I mean, he was a strange guy. He was a yeah, yeah. he was a Mormon for yeah, a start. Yeah, yeah. You know, the strange beard, yeah, yeah. didn't drink. Yeah. You know, and very stone faced. Yeah, mm. I, I can hardly ever remember seeing him smile. I mean, he was always just super serious. And he was just like this shadow. He was just around all the time, just watching. And so I had much more to. I mean, we had much more to do with the English production office. Yeah. Robert Watts, uh, Bruce, Bruce Sharman, Sharman no. Phil Kohler. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But Friend. Gary Kurtz was just yeah. this sort of superior distant figure, figure, distant figure, yeah. who was there just to watch. And when they were doing the recce, trying to decide on a location. 
um, where they're shooting footage here as well as photographs. I'm just wondering if what information might have went back to stills, California. Stills pictures. Stills pictures. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There were no, I mean, this was even before video. Yeah, of really. course, yeah. So you, could, I guess you could, theoretically, they could have shot Super 8 or something, but nothing, it was just yeah. stills. Right? Yeah. Mm. Just took mm. lots of stills. Mm. Yeah. But we, we had uh, Gary Kurtz uh, as a guest in Oslo about one week before going up here. And then private, he was a very nice guy. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, we went yeah. to the, yeah. some museums, we went to Frommelsetan to have dinner, and, and he was a very, very private guy. Yeah. So then, uh, he was very nice. Yeah. Then, then he wasn't the stone face. Okay. Okay. As he, okay. Where, as he was here. That's what was Not the well, professional side. I think. I think he was really. I think he was really. He, he was a shy guy. Yeah. 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 He was shy. I think. I. I probably coloured by the fact that my boss Brian Johnson, the special <laughs> effects chief. At Elstree, he was invited to a, a party with uh, Gary Kurtz. And the following day, we said, how did that go, Brian? He said, that was weird. There was no alcohol. <laughs> it, was a more, it was like, you know, it was like carrot juice. And <laughs> which is unheard of in Britain. It was like, yeah, as, yeah. I, as I said to some of you earlier, you know, but the film business in the 70s in Britain, it was very boozy. There was lots of alcohol. Everybody drank at lunchtime and... I can remember once I was in Elstree and one of the riggers actually fell out of the studio roof with the, what they call the reds, which was these steel girders. He fell out of the roof onto the stage floor, which was like a three-story three drop. Oof. <laughs> and he didn't die. And they said the because only because he was drunk. Because he was drunk. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> he fell like a, he fell like a rag dog. Yeah. And I mean, he maybe he broke some bones, but he didn't die. He didn't die. <laughs> That's great. So yeah, a party with Gary Kurtz where there's no alcohol. That would be a strange guy. <laughs> but in private, he was probably really. He was. He was another other guy private. Yeah. 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 Oh. Can I ask about sorry um, logistics? For the operation in a way where obviously you had that big convoy of, of train carriages mm. initially. Now what 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 happened on a daily basis? Were you getting resupplies of various <coughs> things, diesel or petrol? Uh, it's or? coming in every day. Barrels every day. and barrels of, of fuel. Yeah. That was just and uh, alcohol. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not every day. Oh, yeah. Not every day. Not every day. No, no, no. Uh, and I mean it was, it was supplies coming every day. And, and that was you, your, your responsibility to Well uh, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. We had a buyer at the special effects department with Doug Alberberg. He was going back to Oslo to look up, you know, well, we, we need <coughs> this switch effects. or that. Yeah. So, yeah, things were coming up the railway line. At, the, at that time, they had the uh, train leaving all station, going to Voss every day, both ways, which was only supplies. You right. could, I think you could travel with it. Uh, as a passenger, but it was only made for supplies, for not for us only, but for for everywhere. Had people having had cottages and stuff, but the hotel depended a lot on them. And today, that's a problem for the hotel here to get supplies, because the train stops for two minutes, and you have to, if you need to buy, get some new sofas or, or whatever, yeah. uh, bathtubs or God knows what. You have to get everything off in in like as quick as you can. Yeah. yeah. So for them, it's uh, when that train stops working, uh, that that was a big problem for them. Uh, but for us, that was fantastic. But we got, I mean, we got, we didn't get all these twenty-seven uh, uh, carriages with, with with supplies at one time. It was two, three sometimes, maybe just half of one uh, one day. And when we get all the, we got all the vehicles. That was a lot. That was a lot, and you had to drive them off down on the platform. It was a little complicated, and then the passenger train was going to pass, and that had to be on the platform side, so I had to back up and go on to the other track and wait for the passenger train to leave again and go back and start all over again. Took a long time. Yeah, a lot of work, and the same way to get everything back. And the big huts they, they came in. Uh, they were not built here. They came in as a barracks kind of. Uh, and they were heavy, mm. and to get them off the train was really tricky. 
That was no, no, I bet, I bet, uh, I, problem. I bet putting them up was hard work too. Yeah, you have to tow them up. The rat track told tow them up. Really? Yeah, that okay. could do anything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was yeah, a tough yeah. machine. Yeah. Where did that come from? Because it's there's this slalom slope. downhill slope somewhere in Norway. They use it for Because the other ones came from Sweden, didn't they? Yeah, didn't they came, yeah, snow tracks came from Sweden. Yeah. Do uh, you remember the name of the company? Uh, Optic. Yeah. Yeah. Optic. They all came, came from Sweden, yeah. Yeah, there yeah. Was, a, was a Volkswagen engine. Okay. But, yeah. the, but the gearbox were kind of mirror wise. So it was very confusing to drive them. First, second, third, mm -hmm. etc. And, and with the belts, it's, uh, it's a very heavy thing to move, heavy machinery to move around. So when you get in the first gear, you know, and you get up the speed a little bit and you want to get in the second, and you have a, like half a second. If not, you stop again, and you have to go back and forth and try to get up the speed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it was complicated. And if you turn the steering wheel without, without moving, you broke something. Yeah. Yeah. And then you went on, and the Swedish guy had yeah, to come is. in and climb under there and start uh, dismantling the thing. Yeah. Yeah. The back. They weren't uh, easy to drive. Were no, they? not at all. <laughs> not at all. No. No, it, was a, it was a knack you yeah. had to learn. Because the steering is kind of, you're slowing one belt. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you can't turn the, the, the belt, it's just no. slowing, breaking one of them or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah complicated machinery. Yeah. For each year, I just wondered if you had a lost in memory, something that's always stuck with you over the past 45 years that... Yeah, the girl from the ski lodge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was her name? I can't remember. Oh. It wasn't that part well, of no, I remember. No, no, no. <laughs> she's, today she's 82. <laughs> yeah, no, she's, uh, well, she was 10 years younger than me, so she's 63 now. 63, yeah. 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 Uh, one of the best stories is uh, you were asking for the condoms for the, oh, yeah. you know, from the shop. You all heard that story today? No. About the condoms? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Well, I heard about it. Yeah, no, so it's, it's, uh, they need to use condoms for, for, not for explosives, but for the... Well, we, yeah, we use them for, for bullet hits, you bullet know, hits. To, have, to have blood in, so I don't, yeah. but I don't remember there being bullet hits. Did we do bullet hits here? I don't know. You should know. I should know, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I, it doesn't sort of fit with the universe, you know, yeah. scouts of blood. Yeah. I don't no. Know. You, you, I they get make bad bombs in them. Would you want to put petrol in, in them to make them explode with a little flash in the, in the flame? It could, have, yeah, it could have been that. It yeah. could have been that. But and, they and were for fuel. Anyway, yeah. they asked yeah. for, the, suddenly they needed 12 dozen of condoms. Mm -hmm. And it, it was this shop at the end of the platform here. That was a regular shop at the time. And Elin Eriksson went in there and asked the girl there behind the counter to put 12 dozen of condoms. And she says, oh, I'm sorry, we only have three in stock, but we can get more tomorrow. And Elin says, uh, yeah, okay, until tomorrow. Oh, I hope that will do. <laughs> and, of course, she knew that uh, it was three girls on the whole crew and 100 men. And, uh, the girl behind the counter, she had some what weird was... ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, Harold, as well, did you have a memory, something that stuck with you over the years? And obviously you talked... Um, my, my memory is, uh, is uh, mainly uh, to be able to work for two years together with a, a very international team and very professional people. That was a, 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 a fantastic experience. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I really recall that... Uh, Two years, I was uh, I was engaged by uh, Chapter Two Productions as a, a very very nice period because of all the people. Everybody very nice and very professional. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I always remember, really. Yeah, yeah. I was sharing with some of the, some of the guests here outside this morning. Um, yeah, the first film was, um, nobody took it very seriously, you know, the crew. It was like just another small, low-budget American film. But this one, I mean, this was, uh, this was a whole different ball game. I mean, it was a, all the heads of department were at the top of their game. Yeah. They were, mm -hmm. the, the, the first assistant director, Dave Tomlin, was the best in Britain. 
Peter MacDonald, the second yeah. unit director, was the best in Britain. Norman Reynolds, the production designer, was extremely good. Mm. It, 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 this was a cream yeah. crew. But Bill Wesley. He was he was he was very he was uh, well known as a, yeah. as a, he was a very effective. I mean, you saw on that documentary with him telling yeah, the, really the Norwegian yeah. actors how to oh. use. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he was very energetic. He was a difficult guy, but he was he threw himself into it yeah. like crazy. But he he was he was first assistant director on second unit. On the second unit, yeah. yeah. And I yeah. was for two weeks. I was second assistant director. Under Bill. Under Bill. Wow. And I didn't understand the word of what he was no, saying. No, no, no. <laughs> and he was sick there. I said, arr, 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 arr. Yeah. So I had to yeah. try to imagine what he might be saying. Yeah. Yeah. Screaming that in the megaphone to the rest of the Norwegian extras. Yeah. Yeah. And I asked when Pete McDonald was here a couple of, well, just before the uh, COVID, and I said, to work hard to build Wesley, that was really difficult. I didn't understand the word of what he was saying. And Peter said, I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh God, thank God. <laughs> and he said, that's the only second assistant director I know who does, he don't read the script and he don't have a watch. <laughs> <laughs> but he's doing his job well. Yeah, I, yeah, I worked good. with Bill again on the mission and on uh, at Richard Attenborough's Cry Freedom and, uh, no, 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 Memphis Bell. The mission okay. and Memphis Bell, and and Bill was great on both mm. of them. Mm. But I but I met somebody. I was in Bergen a few years ago, and one of the Nor I met was talking with one of the Norwegian crew, and he had done a commercial outside Bergen with Bill. And by that time, I think Bill was probably that going was, towards. That was, here. That was, that was a Hallmark commercial we made was here. Yeah. Was it? Yeah. Did you have crew from Bergen? Yeah. yeah, and you had and Bill was on that. Yeah. Well, they said that he was, uh, you know, drinking too much. And <coughs> uh, the, the trouble with that production was that the cameraman and the director hated each other. Uh, yeah, it doesn't help. So that was a good reason for drinking too much. <laughs> 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 that was hell. Yeah, but they were. No, it was a very. It was an, a, a top crew, mm. yeah. really. And uh, the, the camera operators. Um, Mike Brewster uh, was one of them. He was like second camera. Or third camera, and Peter McDonald is uh, had him as a kind of, you know, he was under Peter's wing. And uh, when we were here last time, four or five years ago, uh, Peter was t talking about how much how much respect he's got for Mike Brewster. So yeah, some really really good people. The prop crew, Charlie Talbot. Do you remember Charlie no. Talbot? Yeah, really good, really good people. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, you know, the. The top flight. It's good that he did because Lucas bet the farm on, on that second film, yeah. didn't he? And yeah. Luckily, it came through. Yeah. And Robert Watts. You know, well, yeah. Legend. Really clever guy. Really, really clever guy. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I can't imagine any of you would have imagined you'd be here 45 years later Not in talking about it. I just wondered how it feels to have your work that you, you, know, you did, talked about and celebrated all these years on. No, of course it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's it's uh, it's a little bit slightly. I mean, the the only slightly galling factor is if you look up my name, if you type in Martin Gant on on the internet, what comes up is this. Yeah. And yeah. The, you know, there's another fifty films. Yeah, yeah. Where, <laughs> yeah. But it's this. This, this is, is the one. Yeah. You know, this is the one that I am remembered for, which was right at the start of my career. So I was, I, was a, I was a snow shoveler, you know, s s shoveling <laughs> snow into a wind machine and racing around with a, with a smoke car. Uh, what I did 40 years later as a production designer, where I was, you know, designing the whole set, you know, that's forgotten. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the shoveling work. <laughs> yeah. I think we've used up all of our time. I think so we, we have. have. I think we have. Right. But unless anyone has any last questions they want to ask. Yeah, one uh, sneak one in. Quick question. Uh, talking about equipment and props, was there anything lost in the snow? I heard I heard rumors that Star Wars fans are strolling around there in the summertime, so looking for. I'm sure somebody found something later on, but I think they did a very thorough job cleaning up okay. in the summer, didn't they? Mm. I think so. Right. Oh, there was a but, clean up crew, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. 
Oh, was it yes, sir. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. definitely. Okay. But I'm sure, of course, it's something. There is it's something some, up there. It will be something. Okay. So just go on. Have a look. Feel free between in the summer, <laughs> not now. Thank you. And, and any time tonight or tomorrow, ask us. Mm. We are not anxious. Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Guys, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. A uh, big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.